So, uh, your evil friend in the browser, Achim. Thanks very much for the introduction. So, my name is Achim Brucker. I'm a senior lecturer at the University in Sheffield, and before joining the University of Sheffield, I was working in the central security team of uh, SAP, so I have an in industrial and an academic background in software security. Um, that's uh, on my left-hand side is uh, Michael Herzberg. He is a PhD student uh, of mine, and we are working together on the security topics around web browsers uh, in general, and in particular extensions of web browsers. And what we are presenting today is the first couple of observations that we made when looking closer into web browser extensions. So let's start. Um, the first observation that we made during the last couple of years is that web browsers are becoming the new operating systems. And by that, I don't mean that we need to close their windows regularly and reboot them. That happens as well, and this is actually a true uh, alert box from Chrome. No. I refer more to people are playing games in web browsers. People are starting to use web browsers for all kinds of things, like doing image manipulation. Definitely an application area that we haven't thought of using, uh, doing in a web browser for yeah, 10 years ago or so. In the meantime, the whole Adobe suite is available uh, as web applications. Um, people are doing uh, email, banking, and also enterprises are moving their applications towards the web browser. So we are doing a lot of security-critical, privacy-critical tasks in web browsers. So it's important that we get web applications secure. And actually, the situation is not that bad. Uh, we are actually pretty good in protecting users of web applications. There's quite a number of techniques like we are declare, can declare cookies as HTTP only so that web pages have no easy access to them. Uh, we have the same origin policy on the client side, so to speak. We have the content security policy. So there are a lot of mechanisms and all of you that are doing some uh, web application development will know those concepts. That's pretty good actually. So I'm not saying web applications are insecure in general. In contrast, usually web developers are pretty aware of security issues. And also the browser vendors. If you look at the large browser vendors, they are investing a lot of money in resourcing resources in getting the web browser secure. Um, they have a really stable, secure source code base. They are taking security very seriously and really investing in making web browsers trustworthy and secure. So that actually looks pretty good. So we have a solid, good basis for web applications until we start to add extensions to them. Extensions, or for some browsers, they are also called plugins or add-ins, uh, can extend or modify your web browser. So adding new functionality to it, or change the behavior of the web browser. And the interesting part is where we in the meantime have four or five major web browser vendors that all have very mature security programs uh, are very reactive in terms of fixing bugs, vulnerabilities in their products. Web extensions can be implemented by anybody. If you are implementing Chrome extensions, the only hurdle is you have to pay a one-time fee of, I think, five pounds. I guess it's five euros or something similar on the continent or maybe five US dollars. So a low entry barrier. Everybody can do it. And might tear down the whole client-side web browser security from the inside. So let's have a closer look what web extensions are. Web extensions are currently standardized in the context of Chrome, so the other browsers will move to the same extensions model um, and the same programming model for extensions. That's why we are looking here uh, at the Chrome extensions in more detail. Google tells us Add-ons are extending the, your browser, and they are small software programs with little or no user interface. And if we then look into the Chrome store, what we actually find, then we find something like that. It's an online game running as a browser extension. So clearly, I would say the user interface is pretty advanced and complex. And if we look down there um, on the right-hand side, it's nearly half a gigabyte on size. Maybe a lot of media data, but still not necessarily small and simple programs, more a rather complex and large program with a sophisticated user interface. 
Let's have a second look into the Chrome store. Um, <clears throat> let's search for a simple calculator. To whatever reasons you might want to extend your web browser with functionality of adding one plus one. So we are searching for a calculator. So unsurprisingly, a couple of those show up. Let's click on one of them. Looks nice. Let's click on add to your browser. And oops, what's happening there? A permission dialog box shows up as we know it from mobile operating systems like Android, for example. And that simple calculator asks for a permission that reads out, read and, let me, read and change all your data on websites you are visiting. So to whatever reason, that simple calculator actually wants to modify your communication with websites you are visiting at. So potentially, that calculator could change any data that your bank is sending to your client side part of your e-banking application or modify your answers being sent to the bank. So maybe it change, exchanging the amount uh, that you are doing in a wire transfer. So that there's definitely a security risk involved there. People thought about it. We see there are already permissions. Uh, Michael will show you later more in detail how those permission systems work, what extensions actually can do. Um, but is this really an issue? Uh, this is a case happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, people are searching for support numbers of big IT companies. Um, then Google already nicely shows the phone number that you need to call. And somebody put an extension into the Chrome store that actually modified those telephone numbers so when you're searching for the support phone number from a big IT company, not the original support phone number was shown, but some phone number, and I suspect one where you have to pay quite high call, um, fees as a caller, and the attackers made their money with uh, charging them for those phone calls. <clears throat> um, so it seems to be a viable business. Uh, another interesting case, um, interestingly enough, not discussed much outside of Germany, was an extension called Web of Trust. That extension actually had the good intention of making your web browsing behavior more safe by warning you if you want to visit a website that is known for distributing malware. So technically what that extension needed to do was looking at which URL, which website you want to visit, send that information to a server, to a database, look up if the uh, website is known to distribute malware. If not, then let you access that website. If yes, then warn you that you are visiting a potentially dangerous website. That extension was working for years, most likely uh, nicely and as specified. Then that company, as far as I understood it, was uh, bought by another company. They modified that extension a little bit. That extension was actually sending all data of your web request to the database and it was stored there. Um, and then that company started to sell the data that they collected. Not a good idea. A German TV station tried to obtain data from them, and interestingly enough, they didn't even bought the data. They only started negoti negotiating with them about, we would like to have a small test data set to see how good the quality of the data is. And they analyzed that data that they got for free. Um, it was slightly anonymized, but not very difficult. They were able to de-anonymize it. And if you want to uh, know the details about that, there's a nice uh, conference talk from the last CARS Communication Congress where you can look up more details uh, on YouTube, uh, for example. They de the data and found really personal data in there. Text declaration information from German members of parliament, uh, details about an international search warrant where... Uh, Actually, a German police officer used Google Translate for translating parts of the search warrant to English before contacting the colleagues in the UK. Uh, so all the information about the suspect was actually in that data. So with browser extensions, you're really adding something to your web browser 
that might come from a source that is not as trustworthy as the web browser as such. And you might disable security techniques that the web browser vendors are building into their web browsers to protect you as a user of a web browser. So in this talk, we are mainly looking about securing the end user um, of the talk. And Michael will now give you more details about extensions and what they actually can do. Uh, so let's get a bit more technical here with the browser extensions. So how does a developer see browser ex extensions? So let's first have a look and, at how extensions fit into the picture of the whole web browser. So everything here that belongs to an extension is in yellow. So you see the main part of an extension lives sort of in the same tub. So it is from that side already quite separate from all the other tabs that you have usually open in your browser. But only with that an extension could not do much. So an, an extension also has things called content scripts. The yellow bubbles in, in the main tab and by using these content scripts, an extension can basically inject JavaScript into your regular Google or Facebook tab. And it lives sort of side by side to the scripts that are already provided by the website. But all these scripts, they still access the same, the same DOM, the same website. So while they cannot directly interfere with each other in terms of JavaScript variables, they can definitely change and view the, the same DOM. On the, on the right hand side here, we see the manifest of an extension, which is basically the heart of an extension, where it specifies uh, what kind of content scripts it has, what kind of background scripts it has, and also what permissions you your extension wants. That's basically all you need to get started with an extension. Let's have a closer look at the security mechanisms that concern browser extensions. So as we saw, we have background scripts that run in its own tab, and we have content scripts that run basically in foreign tabs. And these background scripts, they are concerned by a sort of two-dimensional permission, permission system. On the one hand, you have functional permissions. You know these kinds of permissions from your Android apps, for example. They uh, regulate how your extension can access your tabs, your bookmarks, if they can intercept web requests or even provide uh, desktop capture uh, functionalities. On the other hand, you also have host permissions. And these uh, kind of govern on which websites you have these functional permissions. So for example, if an extension would have the web request permission, along with your Facebook permission, that would mean it could intercept all requests to facebook.com, but not other websites. On the other hand, the content scripts that are directly running in, in this foreign tab, they have a much more black and white permission system. So you can specify whether or not an ex in con a content script should be injected in the website, but that's about it. Once it is injected, it can basically change the DOM as it likes. So let's now have a, have a closer look at what kind of extensions there actually are. What extensions are there in the wild? We already have seen a few scary examples in the beginning, but it gets even scarier. Uh, so yeah, the Chrome Web, Web Store is the main way of distributing these extensions. You can install them outside from the web store, but Google is more and more discouraging that due to obvious security reasons. So we monitored uh, over 100,000 extensions within the last three months and wanted to learn what kind of extensions are out there, how do they evolve, and especially what kind of permissions do they, do they use. And first of all, we found that extensions can be categorized in many different ways. So we saw um, categories that we expected like productivity extensions or extensions that aid in web development. But we also saw extensions that were games or fun where you would think, 
why does that need to be a web extension that can potentially interfere with all your other internet browsing? We found that extensions are quite big. They are definitely more than just your three lines of JavaScript changing a color of a button or something. So we found many, many extensions were actually larger than one megabyte or even way larger than 10 megabytes. Some extensions were even used to distribute large amounts of MP3 data as a sort of a bypass for a, a CDN. And on the other hand, we have quite a lot of JavaScript in extensions that is, that is being shipped to the user. So in many cases, more than 10,000 lines of JavaScript code, obviously many, many libraries included. And there's basically also no, no upper limit what, what gets shipped in these, in these extensions. And yeah, we only uh, monitored them for three months now, but already in these three months, uh, we saw that not many extensions get really updated. So most of them were in the store since a while ago, and yeah, they rarely get updated, along with, of course, also the use of all the outdated library. Library, so 15% of, of our over 100,000 extensions, they shipped a very old, they shipped a very old Java at jQuery version. So let's now have a closer look at what kinds of extensions uh, we found in the store, especially in regards to what permissions they requested and especially what they can do with these permissions. So the first case is extensions that can read all your history. And that's, and that's just the start of, of my three cases. So in order, to do, in order to do that, they just need either the tabs or all URL permission or, in co content or a content script on all websites. Those are permissions that are, off, that are, that are really often used because you need them to basically do anything at all with, the, with these websites. But once you have them, you can already do quite a lot, like reading all your history, including the full, the full URLs. And yeah, we found in our uh, stash of extensions that already over a third of, of these extensions, they need access or they want access to all of the URLs you visit, not just Facebook or Google, but they obviously want to provide some good functionality to all and every website, like your bank website as well that you visit. And yeah, it's already quite scary to see that the total download numbers of these extensions already are quite, quite large, over 700 million total downloads. So the next stage, we have extensions that can read and write all data on your websites, similar to what we saw on the calculator app already in the beginning. So for that you need just a permission called all URL, or again, a content script on all websites, which is sort of also the minimum level of permissions that you need. So it doesn't matter if you want to change a simple color of a button, make Facebook a little bit more convenient, or completely alter what the website does or displays to the user. And we already found that more than a fifth of all of our extensions request this quite wide permission. And yeah, our, our case number three is a kind of extension that allows to circumvent basically any kind of browser security that, that you have. Achim mentioned it earlier already. Uh, these extensions can have quite powerful permissions. And if you add to the all URL permission, already the web request permission, you can not just read and write what is displayed on the website, but you can also intercept all the web requests. And that includes, for example, HTTP headers. So we learn to love security features like content security policy or same origin policy in the last couple of years, and we're working towards it. And now a simple calculator app can come and just drop all those headers. And it is like as if they've never been there. 
never been sent to the browser. And already this combination of permission was rather often found, but you really have to ask yourself which extension needs to intercept your HTTP headers and stuff. Extensions like, like ad blockers, well, yeah, they need it, but I'm sure there's more than six, there's not just 6% uh, ad blockers in the store. So, and just a quick example, what you need to write a simple extension that sends out all your cookies, all your authentication data from all the websites that you visit. That is basically what you need. You have your manifest, as we saw it earlier. You just specify a simple content script that gets injected into all websites that you visit. And this content script doesn't need to do anything fancy. It's just three lines of, of regular uh, code that can just simply send out all your cookies. And you saw this picture here on the right side of the slides. I didn't forget this here on every uh, slide. It is just that to the user, it all looks the same. It doesn't matter if, if, it, if it only wants to change a simple thing on all websites or completely drop all your browser security. To the user, it will look like this, which at first looks scary, but the fact that most of your extensions that you will install will look like this makes it even scarier. Okay, already rather early uh, at the end. So how can we make web browsing great again? And great means in that context for us protecting the integrity, the confidentiality, and the privacy of the data of the actual web browser user. So that's this, from a web security perspective, maybe a little bit looking upside down, because usually we are always, or we are more concerned about protecting the server infrastructure behind and the web application and the companies offering web servers, uh, web applications want to protect their infrastructure. And of course, they also want to protect their users, but here we are really focusing on the end user. Um, and we've seen pure um, web browsers are really a good starting base um, and the companies producing web browsers are really doing a lot in providing a good basis here but extensions can really destroy all the core security features that we are using and they can provide it by anyone that can be your first grad student, uh, your neighbor, whomever uh, and you don't know. Um, that's the big problem. So what is the outlook here? So from the long term, what we are doing research-wise, or what other people are doing is, uh, Google just released yesterday, or the day before yesterday, a statement that they are looking into sandboxing extensions. Uh, that's definitely already a step forward, uh, most likely providing a better separation that extensions are not influencing each other, uh, and also that ex one extension, if it's only working for specific websites, uh, cannot break out and access data on other websites. Um, but still, um, giving our analysis of the permission model, we clearly are arguing or strongly arguing that we need a better permission model, a new permission model. Uh, the current granularity is in many aspects rather coarse-grained on the one hand, while it feels rather fine-grained on the other. Um, clearly, it looks to me or to us like the permission model is being designed from the perspective of the people building web browsers, but not from the perspective of the people that are building actually web applications. So a lot of uh, permissions are grouped together, for example, for accessing screen sharing, microphone, for showing videos that you might want actually to put into separate permissions because I, as a user, uh, think it's still a difference if I only open up the microphone to an application or the microphone and the video and screen sharing. Um, so we need to look into similar, uh, more fine-grained or different permission models. It's also an idea uh, what we are currently seeing on the mobile operating systems that permission models are becoming more dynamic so that actually mobile applications are asking the user for a permission at runtime. Uh, that makes it easier for a user to understand for which 
purpose for which functionality a permission is actually required um, gives an implicit explanation. I need that permission now because to access, for example, your uh, location data because you are asking me to compute directions to give you some information how you can um, go from the conference venue to the venue for uh, the evening dinner. Uh, makes sense, whereas in other contexts uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense uh, to allowing that um, to the actual uh, permission or extensions. So that's something which we are looking into it, if we can extend the permission model in those ways. Um, not really our research focus, but the research focus of people working on usable security is how to provide better explanations. Instead of only having one explanation, the extension wants to access your browsing history or all the websites you are visiting to make it more clearer to the end user what that actually means uh, and also not discussing or looking at what permissions actually can be put together for a high level explanation to a user. Um, we also think, and that's something where we are actively working on and we hope to release a first version of our uh, analysis framework during the next month, is coming up with uh, pen testing solutions or security testing solutions at all that look at the security of browser extensions, uh, both statically as well as dynamically. Um, but these are all works that are more on the long term, uh, suggesting a new permission model, implementing it, getting it accepted, is definitely an endeavor which takes years, if not decades. So what is the short term recommendation? Uh, because I assume that all of you want to have at least one or two uh, extensions being installed. That at least my experience uh, when talking to other people and looking in our labs around, it's more like they have five to ten extensions installed. So the first thing is be aware of the risk. Um, also clearly check the vendor of the extensions carefully. We've seen in our analysis, and we haven't done yet a, a scientific, uh, really a scientific study on it, but spot sex show that for nearly all famous extensions, there are also a couple of uh, fake extensions in the store which look very similar, which have a similar name as a vendor uh, of that extensions, but are actually not from that vendor and are malicious. So really check that you are getting, if you want to have an extension from Google, that it's really from the Google development team. If it's your extension for your beloved social network, that it's actually provided by that social network and be a little bit more careful and suspicious if that um, extension is provided by a third party. Uh, when installing them, check the permissions if they make sense to you. In particular, check on which domains the extension wants to be active. Uh, for an extension that only enhances in one way or the other uh, the Facebook experience, it doesn't make sense that an extension is active on your e-banking website. Um, I, I personally would also like to restrict my ad blocker on websites that are not my e-banking website because if my bank starts showing me advertisements in my e-banking interface, I will definitely switch my bank and also an ad blocker is modifying actually the information that the web browser is showing to me and that of course could interfere with the data that the bank wants to show to me and a couple of zeros added or missing in my bank account statement make at least for me a big difference. Uh, that's what you can do personally. If you are responsible for a whole enterprise installation of web browsers, the recommendation is not so clear. There are mainly two camps over there. The ones that say, yep, let the users install extensions. Uh, let's make use of the automated updating feature of the extension. So whenever you start your web browser, the web browser checks if it's connected to the internet, checks if extensions can be updated, updates them. The argument of doing that is clearly if the extensions are updated, security issues are fixed, the users are immediately getting them. And we have quite a number of software applications uh, outside of the browser space or the browsers themselves, which showcase that this is a very efficient and effective uh, measurement of keeping end users safe and secure with respect to software vulnerabilities. On the other hand, you have the problem that your users can install any extension and such an extension is a very interesting target for a social attack. Uh, 
I'm not suggesting to doing that, but if I would like to uh, attack a certain company, um, I would actually try to build an extension which offers some service for employees of that company uh, and send out phishing mails, encourage those, user, those employees of that company that I target to install that extension, which suddenly gets access, for example, to all the intranet applications in that company and can send out the data that the extension collects uh, by whenever the users are accessing intranet applications later onto my servers or it can in download and install additional malware. So it's really an open door for attacks. Um, so if you want to prevent that, then the other approach would be governance, restricting installing of extensions or only allow system-wide installed extensions that are distributed via uh, the package and installation mechanisms of your operation system of choice. Um, I think personally there is no clear one is better than the other. It really depends on the case. Uh, just as a side note before I'm closing, uh, if you are interested in that discussion in detail, the Debian project at the moment is leading that discussion internally on the developer mailing list because a couple of weeks, maybe even months ago, they decided to ship Chromium, the open source version of Chrome, um, in Debian with the extension support being disabled by default. Um, so that that version of Chromium without active user intervention only works with extensions that are distributed via the Debian software package man management system, which only provides, I don't know, five to ten different extensions out of over 100,000 extensions. So it limits the choice significantly. The approach might increase the security of the user significantly um, if we assume that those extensions that are provided via the Debian software repository are checked and are often higher quality than the average extension. But that discussion is uh, still to be led and to be, uh, to be decided. Um, with that, um, as a thought for your way home, uh, I'm ending the talk and I'm happy to receive questions or comments. Any questions? Over, over there? Third row from behind. So one question. Uh, you actually said update can be a solution but you actually showed another extension that after update it actually became insecure and uh, made users, um, actually target the users. So um, I don't think update can be a solution. It, it is a solution if you trust the software vendor um, and it avoids most likely it minimizes the number of software vulnerabilities but if the owner of the software product that you're updating changes or you're no longer trusting them, then not. That's what I meant. It's not a clear this is better or worse. Both approaches have the advantages and disadvantages. Um, I would say for the average user, as is overall in the software industry, with forced updates, I think we made an advantage. Okay. And uh, another question is if uh, the same extension wants to gain access to more more things. Can they do it over an update or they need to ask for permissions? When you update the extension and new permissions are requested, then you get a new dialog box that you need to accept. Okay, that's great. Anyone else? Hi. I know that in the past there were instances where extensions changed owners and the new owners did some malicious stuff with the extension. Is there any way to detect it? Um, there should be a way of detecting it because those extensions are actually signed when you submit them to the store. Um, of course, if uh, extension is being sold, then that key used for signing it could be transferred as well. And then it becomes difficult for somebody like Google actually to detect that. I mean, if you are claiming still to be the old vendor, who should somebody know that somebody else is behind that extension now? I see. Thanks. There 
I mean, as a side story, as we have a little bit of time, if you look at the support forums for those extensions, you sometimes see discussions about security issues. We also found a couple of extensions where people claim, actually, I took those malicious extensions and I removed the malicious part and it's now secure. Um, which is a very funny statement. And for those three or four instances where we found them, we are still in the process of doing a manual code review to understand what they actually changed. Is there an effective way to um, figure out what extensions are installed on browsers across the network? That's a very good question. I have to confess, I don't know if the web browsers are providing any possibility of that. Maybe, if at all, then the Microsoft One. Uh, extensions are installed in user profiles, so in the user configuration of the browser, and I don't think that you get access to that via the uh, system-wide management console. That's actually another uh, uh, recommendation that I forgot to say. If you are, want to have a configuration for your web browser without extensions for one specific website, um, the extensions are installed in your user profile, and you can create a browser user profile without extensions for um, critical stuff. Hi. Um, another comment, and maybe uh, you can um, comment on that. Uh, from an enterprise perspective, when you basically allow um, the user to install uh, extensions, um, normally with auto updates, you would say trust Google to basically get change control right and make your browser more secure over time and have it timely installed and deploy on your network. With these extensions, uh, you effectively let the user do the trust decision on whom to trust, and you basically let all these vendors or providers of the extensions actually do the change control for you and your network. Is that what I'm getting out of your talk? To a certain extent, yes. I mean, there is a pre-check by Google because uh, for the Chrome case, people are installing those extensions from the Chrome store as they would on an Android phone install them on, from Google Play. And Google is doing checks for those browser extensions, but still uh, there's a lot um, going through the checks from Google. Um, so at the moment with that, yeah, clearly you're leaving the decision, whatever is installed to the user. I would like just to add something to the discussion because I was also working on this field. And I assume that we cannot fix this, okay? Uh, and because users, they are familiar with extensions that they want them. It's, they are there because they were downloaded uh, as desired. So uh, I drove my research uh, providing real-time knowledge to the backend application server to take the decision whether the, the change uh, uh, added to the DOM by the browser extension is allowed or not. It's some kind of a CSP reports URI uh, feature that you can report back to the backend server and allow the application decide whether it's allow it to run on the on the the web page or not. Uh, what do you think? Uh, another a third option uh, as an update or the um, you provide the, the update and the other solution what do you think about allowing the backend application to take the decision where the extension is allowed or not to run on the application context i would say in more general uh, making the application software more intelligent in terms of doing analytic real time analytics for deciding for getting more insight if the client side is unmodified or not makes a lot of sense and is a very good security measurement. Um, it's quite a high effort. Um, it has its problems with false positives, as we all know, and false negatives, of course. It's also not a perfect solution. Um, and I would say it's kind of a catch and run game. Um, so I'm not saying the problem can completely solved on the client side, but I think there's still a lot of work left to improve the situation on the client side. For example, um, I would immediately vote for splitting up that web request permission in something that only can access the content of the web request and not the headers. Um, and that you then can allow, for example, for a system wide installation, something like users can install extensions that only request certain permissions. Then together with an improved backend side, I think we can make the thing much more secure again. But that's a very valid addition. Okay, folks, that's it. Thanks very much.